For our last session of the day, we're going to talk about the five people you meet in sport. And it's a pleasure to, be present, to, to present to you Caroline Anderson, who is currently working in FIFA and has a lot of experience working in sport. Please join me on stage. Thanks, Anna. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just want to start by saying it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, and I have to say that through the conversations that I've had with many of you, the feedback that I've gotten from a lot of the recruiters, different companies, I have no doubt that many of you are going to be making a very strong impact on the future of sport. I hope today has been a good opportunity for you to get some new ideas, um, a few new pr fresh perspectives, uh, and most, on, most of all, open some new opportunities for you as you look to work in sport. As Anna said, my name is Caroline Anderson, and I work in sport. Um, I currently am at FIFA, uh, working in internal communications as part of the HR team, um, but not part of the recruitment team. So I've tried to distance myself from the conversations that uh, are happening out there. When I was asked to come and speak and share some lessons about my career, it's a little bit um, frightening at first, just because throughout the day you have heard a lot of le lessons from the experts in it, the recruiters, talent acquisition, the ones who know what they're looking for. Again, I'm not that, but what I have is the experience. I've been working in sport for 16 years, currently at FIFA, but I've also worked in event management, professional sport, I've been a consultant, I've been an intern, I've been an employee, and I've also owned my own business. So there have been some lessons learned there, um, and today what I wanted to do was share some of those. When I started to think about the presentation, my brain jumped to a book that I read many years ago, a book called The Five People You Meet in Heaven by Mitch Alborn. Has anybody read it? No? So I can't even make up what it's about. <laughs> <laughs> The reason that I thought about this book is because I think working in sport is a lot like what I believe heaven to be like. No, I'm joking. Sport is obviously magical and full of great experiences, but that's not where I'm headed with this um, presentation at all. The five people you meet in sport is the story of Eddie, an 83-year-old war veteran who dies tragically in an accident trying to save a little girl. Eddie awakens to discover that heaven is a place where life lessons are taught to you by five people who have touched your life. Now, unlike Eddie, since I've read this book, um, I've tried to, Eddie had to wait until he was dead to, to find out these lessons and to find out the people who really had an influence on his life. So unlike him, since I've read this book, I've tried to be aware of the people that I've met along my journey in life and the lessons that they may have taught me. So today, in the spirit of the book, The Five People You Meet in Heaven, what I want to share with you are the five people that I've met in sport and the lessons that they've taught me along my career. So again, my career in sport started 16 years ago when I was straight out of university. I graduated from two undergraduate degrees in Canada and decided that I wanted to work in event management to begin with, more specifically to work on ski resorts, because I'd been a competitive skier and felt like somehow trying to combine being a ski bum with actually pretending to have a career. So as I graduated in the summer, I decided in Canada, I said, well, I need to go and find some snow. So I packed my bags and I moved to New Zealand. And there, I got an interview to join an event management team at one of the biggest resorts in the South Island. And this is where I met the first person in sport who would have teach me an important lesson. Let's call him the interviewer. I'd set up my interview. I'd send in my CV that was full of the education and experience that I had in event management, as well as the skills that I thought that I needed for the job. In this case, it was really to be able to ski and last all day with your boots on and in the cold. The interviewer contacted me and said, OK, let's meet in the middle of town. I thought it was a bit weird, because I thought that he was going to have to test my ability to ski to make sure that I had the skills. But I said, sure, why not? We'll meet there. When I got there, he said, come on, Caroline, we're going for some pizza. 
we went into a restaurant, sat down at a table full of people, who I would later find out were the rest of the event management team, and we had a good time. We ate pizza, drank some beer, talked about nothing in particular. The interviewer only ever actually asked me one straightforward question, and this was at the end of the night when we were going home, and he said, so Caroline, tell me, what do you think about the rest of the team? I have to say afterwards, of course, I thought this was the easiest job interview ever. And I didn't actually realize the importance of it until a few months later when I actually talked to the interviewer about what it was all about. What he was trying to see, of course, was what kind of fit I was with the rest of the team. He could tell from my CV, I had a university background, I probably had half a brain, kind of maybe knew something about event management, maybe not. He could tell again from my CV that I'd been a competitive skier when I was younger, captain of my university ski team, I could probably hold my own on skis. But what was the most important thing to him is how I was going to fit with the team. Was I going to be a good team player with them? Was I going to get along with them? And were we going to flourish as a team? The other thing that was important to him was whether I was going to fit with the role. I didn't know it at the time, but his plan was to build a team in New Zealand that was quite strong, that they could then ship back to the United States to work on some of the bigger World Cup races there. So he needed to know whether I was looking to stay in New Zealand and build a career there, or whether I was open to opportunity and change and looking for new things to do. He was able to pick that up in a whole different way through some of the casual conversations that we had over dinner and beer than he probably would have if he'd asked me in a straightforward interview. So unfortunately, not all interview can be over beer and pizza, and I'm not saying that they probably should be. But the lesson I learned here is to make sure it's a fit. Too often over the years of my career, I've seen people who have taken jobs without actually having met sometimes even their bosses, sometimes the teams that they're going to be working with, or the people that they're going to be managing. Or people stepping into roles where they don't understand the company culture, and what it is that they're actually going to be working at every day. You can imagine, and you've heard a little bit about it today, joining a company maybe like MyKuju versus a FIFA versus an Adidas, very different environments. And so you need to make sure that you're a fit with that, because otherwise it'll probably be a disappointing experience, both for the employee and the employer. So that's the first person I met in sport, the interviewer, who taught me to make sure it's a good fit. And for every interview or any discussion that I have in the future, I always think back about that. Yes, skills and experience, very highly important. But it's also, are you a good fit with the team or with the role that you're entering? After a few ski seasons, my feet got tired, I got a little bit cold, and I decided maybe it's time for something new. I wanted to re-focus kind of focus my career into the area of communication, which was really a specialty and a passion of mine. I ended up moving to England and joining a professional ice hockey team. I'm Canadian, so I must know a thing or two about ice hockey. I certainly knew a lot more than anybody else in England, I think. And this is where I met the second person. My role was in the area of communication and marketing to help the team with that. And a few weeks into the role, I met the second person who would teach me a very important lesson, Let's call him the bully. It was probably about a month into, into the role, um, and I have to say nowadays, we didn't have this term back then, but it's probably what one would call my first Me Too moment. It was late after a game. A player approached me in the office. There was a little bit of physical um, pushing up against the wall, and a clear lesson of... Caroline, if you're going to have a successful career, you're going to have to start to learn how to play the game. You're here to service the players. You can interpret that how you want. I was obviously a bit shaken up after this experience and went home and thought about it. What it made me think about is that when I had started the role, I had kind of drawn a clear line of what I wanted my relationship to be with the players. A lot of them were Canadian, and so we had stuff in common. But I had drawn a clear line to say I wanted to have a professional relationship and how I, myself, was comfortable in handling that relationship. What the bully was asking me to do was to step over that line and not to 
be true to what I had already decided, even though I'd actually decided it a little bit subconsciously. That was the first instant, but it of course isn't the last, that throughout career, there will be people that try and push you over lines that you have drawn. And these will be both women and men that do it. It'll be colleagues, it'll be people in positions of authority. What they're asking you to do is to take a step over a line. And we all kind of know that once you take that step, it becomes a slippery road the farther and farther you get. And once you take a step over a line that you have drawn for yourself, whether it's a professional line, ethical, moral, whatever it is, it's a lot harder to get back on the other side. So this experience with the bully, it wasn't an enjoyable one, of course, but I was almost happy that it happened at an early age, that it taught me that you have to draw very clear lines. And then make sure that you don't let anybody push you over them, because it's very, very hard to step back on the other side once you do. While I was still working at the hockey team, I went back home to Canada um, for the Christmas break and ran into one of my old professors. So this is a person who had been one of my professors from university, a person who had been in my life already, but it was only at this time that they really became someone who would teach me a valuable lesson. We sat down for coffee, and she asked me how things were going, and then asked me, Caroline, how have you gotten any smarter? And I started to ramble on about my experiences, you know, New Zealand, the States, all of this, professional hockey, all of the things that I was um, learning through the job. And she said, that's wonderful, Caroline. But how are you any smarter than when you left university? This started a long conversation back and forth, but to summarize it, what she was trying to get at was that the more that you do a job, of course, experience, you'll gain it, and you hopefully will get better at that job. But how can you get really smarter at the job? And that's only through continual learning. It goes in line with what we just talked about at the panel, and so that's good. But the lesson that I had here was that if you really want to succeed in a career, the experience is fundamental. But the best thing is to couple that experience with education and to keep on learning. So the educator taught me that lesson, is that keep on learning. This is what inspired me to go back and do my masters, and I joined the FIFA Masters, uh, the International Center of Sports Studies. But that's not where it ended. And to add to what the panel just said, one piece of advice that I personally would have about education is that if you've just come out of a master's degree or an educational program, and here you are looking to get into the, the sports world and to start your career or continue your career, don't let this be the last time that education plays a part. Make sure that you keep on learning. Since I finished the FIFA Master, which of course, like many of you will know, stopping a career, stopping getting a salary, means making an investment in yourself to go and back and do your masters. Once I'd made that decision, I can say very fundamentally that it was the best thing that I could have done for my career, but I didn't let it stop then. Since graduating from the masters, I've gone on to complete graduate certificates in communication, diplomas in business consulting, uh, various trainings in the area of communication, strategy, facilitation. Um, I'm a certified professional um, or personal development coach, and I read a ton of books. And I think that this has been something that has really made my career flourish is learning on the job and the experience, but also to make sure that you keep on learning. So that was the lesson that the third person, the educator, taught me. After the FIFA Master, um, I graduated and I was offered an internship at a consulting company here in Lausanne, so TSC Consulting, which is now called Burson Marsteller Sport. This is where I met the fourth person who would teach me an important career life, and we'll call him the mentor. The mentor was very passionate about the development um, and growth of the company, but also about the growth of the people that were part of it. TSC Consulting, international uh, consulting firm that specialized in sport. And at the time when I joined, it was a small company in its first or second year of existence. It had one office here in Lausanne, 
and we were a couple of people. The mentor taught me a lot of things over my time at TSC, but one of the most important things that he taught me was how to be a true professional and what it meant to be a true professional. True professionalism, from his point of view, was, and it was really at the core of the company and everything we did, was about the word caring. It was about caring about your clients, caring about the company, and caring about your own career. And not just doing things because we were getting paid to do it, we were getting our salaries, but doing things because we really cared. At the essence, this comes from business guru who looks at professional service firms, David Meister, who has written a book called True Professionalism. And again, he states that true professionalism is really the courage to care. If you really care about what you're doing, the money will come. If you have the attitude that I will do this because I'm getting paid, but don't expect me to actually care, then you'll probably lose. And it was the mentor that taught me this, the importance of being a true professional and what it means. And this was integrated into everything that we did. Every time I had a new client, I was challenged to find something that I cared about. What if I didn't like the client personally? Then find something about the project that you can passionately care about. And what if I didn't like the project itself? It was a bit boring, not everything can be exciting. Then find something about the people about the client themselves, about the person that you can passionately care about. Because that's what will be make a difference. And I think this lesson went on to show that it, it helped us grow as a company. Um, it helped our clients, first of all, in terms of them getting success. The company did grow from one office to nine um, until 2016 when it was acquired by Burson Marsteller, which was um, a great step forward for the company, but also for my own career. I went from there being a trainee to a project management, a cons project manager, a consultant, a director, and ultimately a partner in the firm. In 2016, we sold the firm, and I decided to sell all of my shares and make a new start, or try something new, a new challenge. And that's when I joined FIFA. And of course, this would be the, where I would meet the fifth person that would teach me um, an important career lesson. We'll call him the reflector. Shortly after joining FIFA, I was walking out of um, our fitness, FIFA Fit, which is our fitness area, and I was with a colleague who had joined a few years before. We were sitting there looking at people playing football. We have a nice pitch beside our, our headquarters. And he was telling me about why he had joined FIFA. Because, you know, it's the biggest federation. You don't get much bigger than FIFA. The number one sport, biggest sport in the world. We're behind the biggest event, one of the biggest events, the FIFA World Cup. The amount of money and power and everything that comes with FIFA and the name. And he's like, you know, it's just so big and it's so great and that's what attracted me. Caroline, isn't it the same for you? And I said, no, that's not at all why I joined FIFA. I joined because of the people. When I joined FIFA, they were going through and they continue to go through one of the biggest organizational changes that an international sports federation will ever go through, at least in my career. And change like that isn't easy for anybody. It's not easy for the top management, it's not easy for the staff at all levels. And the reason I had joined was because my purpose in my career I had found was to try and help people, to try and help people through these challenges and help them so that they could perform at their best. And in my role as internal communications, that's what I'm doing every day, trying to handle these challenges that the change is creating, trying to communicate so that people can do their jobs at the very best, and supporting them so that they can perform. It was the same thing that I had done as a, client, as a consultant. It was really find my clients, what are their problems, and how can I help them? So that was my clear purpose. My colleague, the reflector at the time, looked at me like I was a crazy person. But he's like, well, that's very, very clear. He's like, there's more to being attracted to a place than just because it's big. <laughs> and I said, well, yes, of course. He went away then and tried to think a little bit about what it was that he, his purpose in his career. 
At the time that we'd had this conversation, I have to say he was quite frustrated. He was a little bit fed up. He came back to me a few months later and he was like, Caroline, I've done some real thinking and I've thought a lot about what it is, my purpose, and why I want to stay here. We're a year on now and he's much more engaged, he's much more happy because he's found a clear purpose that isn't just, I want to be here because it's the biggest and the best, but something that relates to his own career. So this was the lesson that the reflector taught me, is find your purpose. Make sure that when you have your career, at the end of it, you can say, you know what, this is what I wanted to be famous for, and this is what I've done. It's not just working at a certain place or doing a certain role, but it's really a clear purpose, because that's what will keep you engaged, and that's what will keep your career path moving forward. So those are the five people that I've met in, in sport and the lessons that I've learned. So the interviewer, who taught me to make sure it's a fit, the bully, who taught me to draw clear lines and not step over them, the educator, who taught me to keep on learning, the mentor, who taught me to be a true professional, and the reflector, who reminded me of the important, how important it is to find your purpose. Now, there's been a sequel to the book, The Five People You Meet in Heaven. I haven't read it, but Apparently there is, it's called The Sixth Person You Meet in Heaven. And I have no doubt that as my career continues, there'll be plenty more people that I meet and plenty more, people, uh, plenty more lessons that I learn. Hopefully today, through either what I've just shared or through everything that the recruiters and different speakers have shared, you've learned some lef life lessons as well. But what I can encourage you more than anything than taking any of our advice, is to really try and pay attention to the people that you meet and the lessons that they might be trying to tell you, because they will have a huge impact on your career as you move forward. And who knows, maybe you're sitting beside one of those people right now. I hope so. So thank you for listening, and I wish you all good luck in the next steps of your career. Thank you, Caroline. And just before we let you...